Welcome to the Scale Tactics Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Sells, a former Army Ranger turned government tech executive and now small business founder passionate about helping small to mid-sized businesses succeed. This podcast is designed to educate leaders on the different operating principles for small to mid-sized businesses. On today's episode, we talk banking and finance with Janelle Giambrone. Janelle is the Senior Vice President and Business Banking Regional Manager at m and Bank, based out of the Northern Virginia area. Janelle's been in the banking industry for 23 years and at m and Bank for 10 years, working with locally owned businesses of all industries to help them thrive and grow. Janelle is also heavily involved in the community, serving as the Treasurer on the Board of Commercial Real Estate for Women Northern Virginia and on their Community Action Committee. She also serves on the board of the Arlington Chamber of Commerce and is on the ambassador committee of the Prince William Chamber of Commerce. Building a strong relationship with a banker can be a game changer for your business. A knowledgeable banker not only offers financial solutions, but serves as a valuable advisor. They can connect you with the right people and opportunities, becoming a critical part of your success strategy. So when choosing a banking partner, don't just focus on the services, consider the people behind them as well. On today's episode, we start off talking about what your banking relationship should look like. We then go on to talk about the difference between equity and debt capital and when it makes sense to go to a bank to finance growth for your company. We'll touch SBA lending, lines of credit, and finally what a personal guarantee is, when it's required, and how much is needed. I hope this episode really helps you think about banking and finance and how you can strategically use it for your company. And now, on to the episode. Janelle, thanks for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me, Brian. Really excited to be here. So going ahead and diving right in, topic for today is banking considerations for small to mid-sized business. And access to capital is extremely important for any business, let alone a growing business. And really, it comes down to investors and banks that provide that capital. And relationships with both are extremely critical. On the banking side, what should your banking relationship look like? It's a great question. It should be exactly that, Brian, a relationship. It's not a transaction or a series of transactions. We want customers to bank when and how they want to. That includes online, remote, after hours. But all of that is basic transaction needs, which every bank should provide. A business owner should have a relationship with a business banker and their team, and not just one individual, a team. What that should look like is collaborating around a strategic vision. What's their short-term goal? What are their long-term goals? And they should collaborate with the business owner circle of advisors and create that relationship. When I first came into the business world, you always think like there's a million banks out there. At the end of the day, like services may differ a little bit when it comes to like the banking products, but they all generally are about the same. It, it was the banking relationship that really set the difference and the connective tissue that our banker was able to be. I know one of Janelle's coworkers is Zach and he was phenomenal that when we needed to try to grow a different part of our business, he not just served as like the banking advisor for financially, how could we get there, but his relationships with other businesses in the industry served as a great intro to, hey, I know another company that either helps work that problem or somebody else that's going through a similar thing. Maybe I could connect you and you, you all could talk. Mm -hmm. But really that came down to knowing what our business was and where we were going. And you had mentioned that and that being key to the banking relationship. What are some of the ways that you see that get teased out? Is that like quarterly meetings with your banker? How do you guys try to get that vision and that direction of where the company is going so you can provide advisory services? It really has to be like any relationship determined um, as a group, frankly. I would say at minimum, they should be reaching out at least twice a year, talking about big picture, how were things last year? How were they on track this year? Has anything changed? Um, and in collaboration with their CPA and any other advisors that they would want to bring into that circle, things can change on a dime. You know, as we've seen through the pandemic, some people it could spur on, okay, well, now I, I think I do want to get out of the business and I need to talk <laughs> M&A at this point, you know, or maybe I want to bring somebody on or I need to completely shift my strategy. So it really depends on the business itself and in collaboration with the banker, I would say at minimum twice a year in a deep dive, but regular contact points of uh, just like you were saying in terms of connecting people in the network, um, it's really about those local relationships and the network introductions as well. That could be as um, simple as we're doing networking events together. Maybe they're part of an organization, 
we're heavily involved in our community organization, so sometimes bringing them in to events that we have with panel discussions, um, making those connections. It can be as frequent as weekly, depending on uh, what it lo- what it needs to look like for that business owner. Yeah, and I think you bring up another great point there is when looking at different banks, that's a good question. I personally think to ask is what are some of the extracurriculars, if you will, um, I know your bank in particular has a lot of partnerships. Part of that is just given also the size of the bank with different roundtable discussions. I know even you guys have access to who's who in DC type podcasts that you can help connect folks with. Definitely a good question to ask, I would say, when, when teasing out a different bank would be some of those panels. What are some examples of some of the different events that y'all have done for the community and for your clients? We have every single banker in typically a leadership role with a community organization. I, as an example, I am on the board of Commercial Real Estate for Women, Northern Virginia. I'm the treasurer and I'm part of the Community Action Committee. And then I'm also on the board of the Arlington Chamber. We have everybody involved in pretty much every chamber. Uh, Some events that we have are with CCAF, Small and Emerging Contractors Advisory Forum. It's a government contracting, contractor, nonprofit organization that helps with connections and education. With CCAF, we are sponsors of the annual gala. It's a really huge event. We were nominating a lot of the government contractors that we work with. One of the things that I like about that specific organization, I was meeting with a government contractor who said they were solicited by some organization around getting a potential award, but they would have had to basically pay to play in terms of they'd, they'd just be buying themselves an award. And I said, well, we're part of CCAF. Um, it's a great advisory forum. It's a nonprofit. This gala is really well known. A lot of the local players in the GovCon industry are, are there, and it doesn't cost you anything. Um, if you get nominated and you go through the process, you can buy a ticket at the event. Um, but that's it. And it, it was a bit of an eye opener. It, you know, the, the theme you'll hear throughout this is you don't know what you don't know. And they were just thrilled to have learned of an organization that is truly helping, at, you know, with a, a nonprofit aspect to it, to really help the GovCon community learn more about the different missions of each company and also a mentor protege program, you know, how to essentially help each other. It's really all about the community and the relationship. And that's our job where I, I see, to your earlier point, banks are a commodity. We should have pretty much all the same services. We. There are differences in services, but it really comes down to that relationship, that community involvement, the introductions that we make. It's all about accountability. You know, um, if you're dealing with a banker and they say, well, here's here's the services, here's whatever, um, you need more than that because you don't know what, what you don't know. And when somebody is showing up in the community, no one and no organization is perfect. So when you know that you're local, we're all here together, we all have a common purpose, uh, that accountability really is there. If something gets messed up, you, they know where to find me. Um, we're we're going to you know figure it out and work through it together. Those are some great examples of how different bankers can provide different services and really compete differently with those with those networking events and things that are taking place outside of work. Moving on to banking services, what are some of the traditional services you see small to mid-size uh, businesses requiring? Just like you as an individual need a bank, so does every business need a bank. Often we see business owners utilize their personal bank for their business, which may be completely fine. It can serve their needs just fine, depending on their growth trajectory. Again, I often say you don't know what you don't know. I've seen business owners co-mingle personal and business funds. Uh, Some business owners have been told they're not eligible for financing when they are. Some may be over leveraged and find themselves in a difficult turnaround situation. But most of all, as I stated before, a business owner needs an advisor and a team who understands their industry and values integrity and candor. All of that to set up traditional services that every business needs is going to be an operating account, like you're used to your checking account, possibly a savings or investment account, depending on what their cash flow needs are, both the timing of when they need the cash and their risk appetite. Every business should consider a line of credit for working capital needs. What that means is timing their cash flow with accounts receivables and accounts payables, and frankly, just having it for emergency. It's always important to put a line of credit in place prior to needing it. Uh, Other services, and and we can get into um, further details, I'm gonna throw a lot 
of jargon out there. Other services would include merchant services, which is receiving credit card payments. A corporate card, that would be paying by credit card. That also extends their cash flow cycle a little bit different than a line of credit. And then what I would call treasury management services. That's just an umbrella terminology that includes services that you would have on your checking account, such as wires, ACH, which are electronic transfers such as bill pay, possibly foreign exchange if needed, and most importantly, fraud protection services. So th those all fall under what I call treasury management services. And again, I just threw a lot of terminology out there, but a business banker and their team can do a deep dive and make appropriate recommendations. Yeah, and I think you hit two key points that are, that are worth noting there is the intermingling of finances. That works great until it doesn't for multiple reasons, especially if you are looking for an M&A event. That can be very messy on the back end to try to clean up in a due diligence, as well as probably the first conversation, if you haven't had it with your banker, is how are my accounts organized? How is my business running? And does the account, the chart of accounts make sense? with the way that I'm wanting to run my business and manage my business. I would highly recommend any existing business if they're comparing. I put it in terms of have an apples to apples comparison and then ask for an apples to oranges comparison along the lines of you don't know what you don't know. So to your point, Brian, it's here's what I have, here's what's working, here's on my, my wish list, and also advise me and what I don't know, what should I have on my account? So that's where it takes a, a really thorough conversation and understanding of literally how money is moving in and out and what their purposes are, who the vendors are, who the payments go to, uh, what their concerns would be if they changed accounts or had multiple accounts. And again, always talking about fraud. As we start diving into some of these different business banking services and instruments. I think it's a good point to start with equity and debt capital because sometimes that can trip folks up on what a bank can actually provide versus what you may need to go to investors for. How would you describe the difference between equity and debt capital and really the business needs that drive going to investors versus a bank? Great question. Equity capital is funds raised by the company in exchange for ownership rights for investors. It's really the difference between equity and debt is gonna be investors versus uh, an, either an institution like a bank or a family or a friend. So equity capital, funds raised by the company in exchange for ownership rights for the investors, it represents an asset for the company. Debt capital is a liability for a company that they have to pay back within a fixed period of time. Every business owner needs to invest money into their company and there comes a point in time on their growth path when they need to decide whether they put more money in themselves, they raise money from additional investors and thereby give away ownership shares, or they borrow money, which is debt. With debt financing, the lender, which can be a financial institution, a bank, a family, a friend, that lender has no control over the business. So the business owner can project cash flow easier in the sense that the repayment terms are known and predictable, just like you know the repayment terms of your, your car loan. You as the owner are typically required to personally guarantee the loan if the business is less than, let's say, 50 million in revenue, which is most small to mid-sized businesses. And I will put out there, Brian, some people, um, with some owners can get really upset at the idea of a personal guarantee. But I like to think of it in terms of the lender not having any ownership or control over the business. And that personal guarantee is the owner saying they're going to pay us back. It's not taking any specific collateral. It's really their word on the dotted line saying they'll pay us back and stand behind their business and future cash flow. Equity financing involves investors and giving them ownership in exchange for their funds. The investors, unlike a lender, assume risk. So if the company fails, investors don't get paid back. However, with their ownership, they'll share in the profits and are part of the decision making and control. To remove investors, then you'd have to buy them out at a later date, which if the company is doing well, as you would expect and hope for, it will be far more than their original investment. Good simplification of comes down to ownership and control and who owns what. I think the other question I have is obviously there are some cases that are appropriate for debt capital and other cases that are appropriate where you're going to have to go get an equity raise. What are some of the cases that you see businesses come to you when that are appropriate for debt 
versus times that they come to you and you're like, hey, this is really something that you're probably due for another raise of equity capital. It's really kind of putting it in terms of being bankable. What I would say, the first thing that we would look at is the historical cash flow. If the company has had positive cash flow, then that's where a bank can come in. The, uh, the, the flip side of that is what I call a turnaround situation. If a company has been showing losses and true losses, not anything that you can add back like depreciation or, or interest or amortization, things like that, or maybe a one-time explainable um, expense that, that caused that loss, when they do have true losses, that would be a situation where a bank is not able to come in and fund because it is that turnaround situation. Just think of it in terms of risk. So without us having the ownership nor control, we are not able to assume that risk. That would be very appropriate for either the owner to put in more money themselves or to do and uh, um, to go to the investment pool. Is there a time that I could be profitable but it may still not be appropriate to, to get debt capital for you know an investment in my company? If a company has positive historical cash flow, it, it, that's a great start, right? In terms of, okay, should I be approaching a bank? The, the next thing to look at is the balance sheet in terms of do they have um, positive equity on the balance sheet? That could be something that is also underwater, if you will. And then also to consider what is the actual ask is the ask far more than the balance sheet and the profit and loss statement can currently support. So depending on what they, they need, that could be, okay, I've got to go to the investor pool and, and raise money um, versus getting it from a lender. So the metrics on the balance sheet and the profit and loss statement are uh, would need to support it. So let's say that I want to roll out a new product line within my company. I currently am making a profit on my existing product line, but I want to invest in growth to roll out a new product line. Would that be something that I could go get debt capital for, or would I need to go to an investor pool to get that capital for more growth? So the answer to that question would depend on the positive cash flow on the balance sheet. Um, it, so it comes down to three sources of repayment, essentially. Your first source of repayment is going to be the cash flow. Is the historical cash flow there enough to support how much you need? And then if, if the answer is, is yes, great. The, and we assume that the balance sheet also has positive equity. Again, it would likely have collateral there in terms of accounts receivable. So the, it sounds like the answer is yes, so long as your current balance sheet and cash flows support the amount that you're wanting to get yes and it would depend on exactly how long the repayment term that kind of goes into short term or long term uh depending on what the you know i guess you'll you'll ask about the key metrics but yeah essentially whatever the debt is proposed we would then project out the payments and make sure that the company can support it such that they have enough net income that they're about 20% above break even. So if all of those are there, then by all means, it would make sense for bank debt. And that's kind of getting into the weeds again of yeah. what's the use of the funds, um, how long would the repayment term be, and for us to recommend the right type of uh, debt vehicle that's appropriate for the use of those funds. If I'm wanting to invest in a new phase of growth for my company, when trying to decide, do I go to investors versus taking on debt? One of the key considerations would just be, what are my current financial state? And if I'm positive, then I can leverage some of that to get debt financing, but I'm only gonna be able to get so much. If I'm looking for some type of exponential increase in funds, then I'm probably gonna need to go to investors instead of trying to go just take on debt capital. Yes, absolutely. One thing to add there is that if the historical cash flow is positive, but it may not be enough for what the, the request is for the use of funds. And let's say they're in an expansion phase. That's where we could potentially utilize the SBA program where we're considering the business's projected cash flow. So it could be based on um, a, a expansion. We had one, it was a psychologist practice that was expanding into the, the location right next to them. They leased the property, they didn't own it, but they had the opportunity to expand uh, literally next door. The historical cash flow didn't support the expansion, but it was positive. And we were able to assume, okay, well, with the number of patients that you're gonna have and new employees, 
can we project out what that profit and loss will look like over the next two years with the additional space and expenses? And absolutely, it was able to support it. So we were able to accomplish it with projections and utilizing the SBA program in that situation. Yeah, that makes total sense. And and we'll highlight the SBA here a little later in the show. Want to go into uh, continuing to dive some of the banking services before we get to that. So starting with line of credit, one of the key functions of a business, especially as you're waiting to get your accounts receivable in, but have bills and payroll that needs to go out. So how does a line of credit work and what are you, what are you looking for when trying to do the size and rolling it out? Line of credit is really key. Uh, every business should have a line of credit. As I said earlier, if nothing else for emergency and getting it in place before you need it. So a line of credit is for short term working capital which we define as funds that will be borrowed and repaid in less than 12 months. So think of it as a personal credit card that has a revolving balance. We want to see the balance go up and go down. What we don't want to see is a balance fully drawn and stagnant, literally the opposite of revolving. (laughs) So for example, buying a car uh, would be a long-term debt that you have monthly amortizing payments until it's paid off. While smaller purchases like a computer, groceries, or entertainment, you're getting reward points or cash back on a credit card, uh, but you're paying it off with your regular cash flow. So think of it 12 months or less revolving, that would be a a line of credit and how it would be used. In terms of determining the size of a line of credit, to determine appropriate size for a line of credit, a very basic rule of thumb is a combination of a few factors. You can look at 10% of your previous year's gross revenue, 80 to 90% of your accounts receivable aged less than 90 days if you have accounts receivable like a government contractor would. And with a government contractor, you'd also consider a contract backlog report which hasn't yet hit your accounts receivable, but they're awarded contracts. So we look at a combination of all of those to really understand what line of credit makes sense. Another metric to throw in there would be one and a half times your payroll needs. This is where we as business bankers love to understand the story behind the numbers as much as a business owner loves to tell their story. It's not a matter really of just a formula or a credit score. So for example, a growing company's gross revenue and current AR, they may not qualify them for the amount they need. But let's say it's a government contractor, they're growing, the awarded contract backlog report is really what will get us to help understand how that future income on awarded contracts can get us to a line size that may be higher than their current AR and balance sheet support. Alternatively, for long-term financing, needs like equipment, vehicles, commercial real estate, which is repaying longer than 12 months, I recommend term debt that has set principal and interest payments and amortize over time, just like I mentioned your home mortgage or your auto loan. So now that we've discussed what a line of credit is and how you typically do the analysis to figure out what amount may be right for your business, what are the gates I need to go through to get that thing set up and be able to start using it? For an initial assessment for a line of credit, what we would typically look at is a financial package. And for our purposes, I'm going to assume we're not talking about a startup, although as a side note, M&T is a number one SBA lender and we, we help startups in a variety of ways. The additional documentation that I would add for a startup would be a business plan and two years of projections. Okay. So startup aside, the typical financial package that we would request would be two years of tax returns, both both business and personal, an interim year-to-date financial, so profit and loss and balance sheet. And then addition to that would be a personal financial statement of the owners that are 20% or more. There may be additional documents needed uh, depending on the industry, yeah. such as if it's government contractor, the accounts receivable, the backlog report. And we would take all of that, I would say within a week or two, um, likely quicker, we'd be able to assess together, here's what an appropriate line amount is, Uh, dig deeper. Again, it's not just, here's the numbers, does it fit into anything? There's always so much more to understand behind that. In fact, I think the majority of what we do at M&T, I jokingly say it stands for meet and talk, (laughs) is to really understand what is going on. Well, it's a subjective, it's a subjective thing, you know, Yeah, there's hard facts and numbers, but in business, there's just so many other factors. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. So those would, that, would, that would be the heart of what we'd be collecting uh, to do the actual assessment of, okay, here's a line am amount that we think that makes sense. And then moving forward from there in terms of getting things set up with a relationship, let's say we agree, um, okay, I think a 500000 line of credit makes sense for your business. Here's all the terms on it. Uh, we're ready to rock and roll. The next step would be getting all of our loan documents in place to have signed. And we would want to set up at a bare minimum that operating checking account for the relationship. Because as you would imagine, again, at the, with a lender not having ownership, as far as uh, you know, the risk factor goes, the relationship is incredibly important. We're, we're lending out the money. We also want the deposits to be flowing through our institution as well, so we can really see the transactions and understand our customer. So with the, with the deposit account, that would be your basic organizational documents just to get started. Uh, it's nothing complicated. We can do that very quickly. And is there any type of personal guarantee required or just the financials and the business plan business trajectory is enough to get a line of credit established? Really good question. A personal guarantee is going to be required on businesses that are typically under 50 million in revenue. And I do get pushback on that from time to time of like, wait a minute, um, or, you know, I have it set up as an LLC and you've got my business. And it really comes down to it as a personal guarantee, it's saying without the bank taking specific collateral that you're gonna pay us back and that you stand behind your business. When the balance sheet is astronomically large and you know, you're that 50 million revenue sized company, it's a, it's a different group. Yeah. And that's usually when that personal guarantee comes off. But usually when there's a comfort level with the relationship with the bank and understanding what happens in an event of default, I think that's an incredibly important discussion to have early on. As bankers, we tend to look at it from a worst case scenario because we don't have that ownership interest. What happens if they're too leveraged? And believe it or not, bankers should not want to leverage you too much. They want to know that you have the ability to succeed and pay us back and also have <laughs> profits for yourself and your employees. So really having that discussion, you know, what happens in a worst case scenario? What if this goes completely sideways? Do they have enough personal liquidity? And that's part of what that personal guarantee is for, so that you have those three sources of repayment. Primary is cash flow, second is collateral, which we hope to never liquidate, and the third would be that personal guarantor's uh, liquidity and collateral, which we also hope to never liquidate. But that way you're setting somebody up for success by looking at all of those sources of repayment and hopefully giving the business owner that confidence that, you know what, here's my best case, my most likely and my worst case. And, you know, I would survive and my family would be okay if in a default that worst case situation happened. That makes sense. And what would be some examples of a personal guarantee? Um, what would be some examples of assets that y'all would look like or that y'all would look at? So with a personal guarantee, there's no specific taking of collateral. It really is saying, I guarantee that we're going to pay this loan back. What we're looking at on the actual guarantor, let's say, you know, Brian LLC is coming to me. I would look at your personal tax returns to see what your income is, your debt to income ratio and then really seeing what your liquidity position is. As an example, if someone were coming asking for a million dollars and they have 2,000 in liquidity in their checking account and you know a good amount of credit card debt, it wouldn't be appropriate. They would need to potentially ask family and friends, um, you know, raise money or save more money before they're getting into that type of leverage. So if I was going for a million dollar line, though, would I have to have a full million dollars in collateral to personally guarantee that? Or how does that kind of work? Great question. Absolutely not. The, let's say you're going for a million dollar line of credit. I would like to think that your business would support that from yeah. the balance sheet. Uh, let's say, you know, you have 1.2 in, in accounts receivable. They're aged less than 90 days. There's your collateral. You got profitable cash flow on the business side. Personally, we would want to see that your debt to income ratio is, I would say, around 40% and that you have liquidity enough, um, that you have a cushion that you can take care of your own personal debt at that ratio 
and you do have some save savings, but by no means would you need to have a million in liquidity personally to then, you know, get a million dollar line of credit in place for the business. It's a good question. Yeah, it definitely makes sense. Definitely. As, as we've talked about kind of theme of the day, subjective whole picture, you don't have to have all that. It's, Hey, do you have some liquidity that if there's right. a really, really, really bad day, we still think you're able to pay, make payments off a loan? Or the Absolutely. Line. Moving off the line of credit and into some of the other uh, debt vehicles that a small business can use. I know you have equipment lines, commercial mortgages, purchase cards. Uh, can we just start going through those? Probably starting with um, an equipment line and what that, what is that? What does it look like? How is it typically used? Yeah, great question. So equipment line or a loan limit, it's essentially a pre-approval for equipment purchases. And the terms of repayment are in line with the useful life of the machinery. It's usually somewhere between three to 10 years. For example, we have a towing company. Um, they have an approved loan limit amount. It allows us to look at all those financial documents that I mentioned at one time. So essentially taking all those financials, underwriting an appropriate amount of the line so that it's approved and in place. And then when that business owner finds a uh, one of those massive tow trucks that they need you know, to continue to either replace or improve their fleet, they let us know, they send us the invoice, then we already have that amount approved under the whole line or loan limit. We then get loan documents, have them sign it, and we basically fund it immediately. So it's somewhat of a pre-approval to have that line or loan limit in place for them to draw on as they find equipment or machinery or vehicles that they need. What about commercial mortgage? Obviously pretty straightforward, but um, typical use cases and how that goes down. It seems straightforward, but if you haven't owned a commercial property before, it's interesting how many people come to us thinking that a commercial mortgage is going to be the same as their home mortgage and thinking I'm going to get, can you give me the pre-approval and it's good for 30 years. It's not quite the same for commercial. Commercial mortgages are typically going to be terms in five, seven, or 10 years. And it depends. We could potentially go up to 15 um, if it's owner occupied. So that's one of the bigger differentiators. But I will say big picture, commercial mortgages are fantastic in the sense that real estate is a great asset. And then we would qualify that in terms of there's either owner occupied or investment commercial real mm -hmm. estate. Investment is defined as less than 50% owner occupied. Uh, one thing that's a little bit different nowadays in terms of investment real, est real estate is that we're not so much looking at office space. That's definitely taken a bit of a turn um, after the pandemic as people are more hybrid or virtual or downsizing. But if you think of it from a business owner standpoint, rent is usually one of the highest expenses other than payroll and owning maybe something to consider. However, it's not generally recommended for a startup, depending on what the startup is. And then, so looking at a purchase card, obviously that is, that is an interesting topic, especially as you grow. Normally you start off with like the capital one spark card or something like that, but then you start finding the, okay, I have more, more team members that may be traveling or making purchases and having one corporate card starts to become a bottleneck. So I need to open that up. Uh, across the business. Um, how does the pr purchase card program work and what are some of the things to consider when rolling one out across your business? Purchasing card is essentially a business credit card to your point. Uh, it's in the name of the business and not in your personal credit. That's a big deal. A lot of times I come across uh, small business owners that do have it on their credit report. And in fact, that can be a situation where somebody ends up having a really low credit score because they have multiple cards that they're using for their business. And it's a little bit of a catch 22 where their score is low, but they're, you know, we're assessing them for a line of credit and a purchasing card at the same time and making the case by diving a little bit deeper into their credit report that if these were all moved to a business corporate card or purchasing card, it helps their personal credit score, takes all of that off there and, and appropriately puts it on the business balance sheet, if you will. So that's one thing, just you know, high, a, a high level picture that's really important to note about the purchasing card being on your business and not your personal credit report. We have two different programs and it depends on the amount of the annual spend. 
The smaller card program allows a business owner to carry a balance, while our larger card program has an automatic payment that's drafted in full each month. So again, it really depends on how much do they need, how many people will be using it, how are they also going to be repay repaying it. Some do need to carry a balance, and that would be appropriate for the smaller card program. Either card, though, it allows you to extend your cash flow, and you can have as many users on the card as you need. When you're paying um, in full each month, you're not incurring interest like you would borrowing on a line of credit. So that's also something to consider. Uh, oftentimes, we'll pair a line of credit with a purchasing card, and they can decide when and how it makes sense to use it. Both of them extend their cash flow. It gives them working capital, mm -hmm. but you would incur um, you would incur daily interest on whatever's outstanding on a line of credit, unlike a purchasing card if it's paid in full the next month. Oh yeah, that makes total sense. Great point. At least buy yourself a couple of weeks without having to hit the line and yes. saving on the interest. You also asked about pitfalls and and you know things that I've seen there. I would say make sure that you have the appropriate controls and credit limits in place per car card holder. That's really key. We had a client who had a corporate card. I want to say the limit was around a million dollars. They had it on one physical card and they kept it locked in a safe, but they used the number electronically. So, I mean, you think about that from a risk standpoint. We recommended that they still have a million available, but not all on one physical card and set it up with a purchasing card program for specific users and limits to minimize risk. So that's something to consider. What are the internal controls? Who needs to be using it for what? I will say on our card program, we can make it as uh, unique to the client as possible with as many limits as they want or don't want. And in real time, they can shut somebody off or they can approve a certain type of purchase but that way you have a sense of peace, again, along the worry of fraud to be able to have those controls in place. The one thing I'd add too on considerations we found, purchase cards are great. They help decentralize a, a bottleneck when it comes to booking. It also helps your team members where, you know, especially if you have a lot of travel and, and heck, even if it's just periodic travel, you know, it can cost anywhere from 500 to a thousand bucks for a business trip. And if people are having to put that on their personal card and then file when they get back, you know, that's just, that can get very frustrating for, for your team members to have to ride that debt for your business and wait on their paycheck to come in. So I think the thing I always noticed was it's great to have it, but to your point, think through some of the controls and pre roll out. You don't want that just to be where everyone's buying everything. And from an accounting perspective, there are needs to make sure that your corporate cards are not creating a financial CPA nightmare. So that, that would be the one thing I'd say is make sure you're talking with your CPA or your in-house financial team or a combination of both to see, hey, what financial controls and organizational processes do we need to put in place so the barriers are there before you roll out the card instead of having to do the nightmare on the back end when now you've got a thousand purchases you're trying to get receipts for and you know, all that stuff. Yeah, very well said, Brian. I, I couldn't agree more. And I would add, in terms of employee retention, that is a bit of a burden if you are asking employees to put things on their own cards and then submit for reimbursement. So from <laughs> with a tight labor force as it is, you think of that as really an employee perk too, to be able to have, well, here's a, here's a purchasing card for the business. Here are the limits and the amounts on it. So there's safety and there's guardrails and kind of everyone can be happy. Okay. Now that we've touched uh, a lot of the uh, lending products that are out there for just debt vehicles, one of the other ones and one of the big ones that businesses use is SBA lending. So what is the SBA loan used for? When's it appropriate? And just some considerations uh, when talking with a banker about potentially taking out uh, an SBA loan. Absolutely. The SBA refers to the U.S. Small Business Administration. It's a government program that guarantees a certain percentage of the loan to be repaid. There's a lot of lending products under the SBA program as, as a whole. Uh, they basically allow a bank to lend to a company where perhaps that historical cash flow is not existent, such as a startup. There's nothing to underwrite, essentially, right? It's that business plan and projections. Or there may be a large collateral shortfall. Uh, that may be the case with a business acquisition, for example. 
in total, the SBA program can lend up to five million. So it, it really runs the gamut in terms of um, how it can help a business from startup or, like I said, if, if it's an acquisition, they're going to be on a pretty big growth trajectory. It, it's not applicable to any lending, as I mentioned before. It's not applicable to a company that's showing losses in that turnaround situation. That would be more appropriate for um, investors. With SBA financing, a bank must provide the funds, but the government guarantees repayment to the bank of a certain percentage of the loan, even if the business were to default, as long as the bank has properly underwritten and documented the loan. We're a preferred lender and number one in the DC metropolitan area and have done enough SBA loans that we can all agree it's a lot of paperwork and it does take a lot more time, but they absolutely serve a purpose to startups, acquisitions, companies that are expanding where historical cash flow is positive but may not quite be at that target debt service coverage ratio. In other words, we need to underwrite uh, based on projected cash flow, but again, the historical is positive. So we collect financial packages, we underwrite them the same, whether they're SBA or non-SBA. We'll always go non-SBA or conventional when we're able because it is less time, less paper, and less fees. However, I do want to say when you go SBA, it generally should be able to close from start to finish within a two-month time frame. I have heard of situations where it's been nine months or more, and that really should not be the case. So although it is more paperwork and more time and there are fees that go along with that, it shouldn't be too terribly long, but do expect a good amount of documentation in the financial packages that need to be collected. And Sue, I think SBA is pretty straightforward if I'm trying to buy a business. Obviously, with the due diligence, it needs to be a business that is not failing, <laughs> as we talked about. But there's easy collateral, easily cash flow to look to look at to uh, make that determination. But if I'm a startup, you know, de novo and something, what are you looking at or what is the federal government looking at as well to underwrite that loan to get the capital you need to get going? Startups would have that business plan and the projections. Projections are going to be two years of profit and loss projected monthly. And what we want to see there is a realistic projection. Um, sometimes we'll get some that are so incredibly awesome <laughs> that you're like, well, wait a minute, how realistic is this? So that's where you kind of go into the business plan, really understanding what's the experience here. Both the bank and the SBA require that there is relatable experience for the business owner. So as an example, let's say you wanted to start a, a daycare facility, but you've never run a business, you've never run a daycare. That's not to say that you can't still do it. In fact, I, I certainly have an example in mind where we did exactly that. What happened in that situation is they needed to have somebody with the experience who would be running and managing it from day to day so that it satisfied both the bank and the SBA's criteria in having relatable experience. That person, although they may be a non-owner, let's say they're a manager, they would also have to fill out what's called a form 1919 for the SBA because they are the main person with the experience. Although they're not guaranteeing, they're not an owner, it doesn't change any of that ownership. So big picture, we're looking for that business plan with as much detail as possible into the competitive market, their background, the experience, and really detailed projections on the cash flow to really substantiate Again, that most likely best case and worst case scenario so that within essentially a year, they would be at break even. And then as you know, the relationship continues as bankers in those continuing conversations, we take a look back and see, well, how are things going? How does it compare to where you originally projected? And that's where I also like to set the stage on those projections. We want you to meet them. So be conservative enough that they are realistic, but that you're not going to fall short by a tremendous uh, you know, gap when we do look back in about a year or so. And would that be something that you would really want to look at the SBA lender, that they have depth of knowledge in that industry, I imagine? So that way, when it comes time to that underwriting, you think you have a good plan. You're talking with somebody that knows that industry well and can really say, yes, this plan makes sense. 
Yes, absolutely. First, anybody looking for an SBA loan, which would be a startup, should go to a preferred SBA lender. And that's something that you can actually find on the SBA website. So that's first and foremost, they would need to be a preferred SBA lender. Then by all means, you know, I, Brian LLC wants to start that HVAC company. I think one of my first questions would be, do you have experience with startup HVACs? Uh, do you have many, you know, in your, your portfolio? And do you, could you connect me with advisors that you have? It, it could be somebody that's helping with the business plan or the projections and by all means, um, utilize those resources and those connections. One resource to put out there for any business, you're, there's also local SBDCs, small business development centers. They're a great resource to help with those business plans and the projections, and, and it's free. So it's something that is underutilized um, and they can work in conjunction with the bank. But great question, yes. Find out first the preferred lender, and then by all means, do they have experience in that industry? Last question of the day, what is separates a preferred lender from anybody else? A preferred lender is somebody who's vetted by the SBA to partner with the SBA program. So you have to reach certain qualifications to actually be a preferred lender. It also means for us that we have our own internal SBA documentation because as a preferred lender, essentially the SBA is saying, we know that you are following the rules of our process and our criteria, our documentation, and therefore we're able to do it in-house. If okay. you're not a preferred SBA lender, that financial institution would have to work directly with uh, the SBA in California and send everything over there. So really you're looking at speed, <laughs> speed, yes. of, speed and experience. Yes. So. Janelle, I appreciate you coming on today and, uh, and sharing uh, a lot of information about banking in the small, mid-sized business realm. If people would like to connect with you, of course, Janelle's with MNT out of the DC area. What's the best way to uh, get in touch with you all further? Absolutely. My LinkedIn profile has all my contact there. Um, I am definitely one on email and text like everybody else. Just a simple, straightforward www.mtb.com. All right, perfect. Well, Janelle, thanks again. Until next time, everyone, thanks for joining us and happy scaling. Thank you so much for having me, Brian.